the halftime show of the Super Bowl this year? Any of you watch that? Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, unlike a lot of people, I love those halftime shows. Um, sometimes the music is really good, and you got all that good choreography and all that fabulousness. I mean, I'm really into it. Well, this year, I was with a bunch of friends, and I remember reaching over and grabbing a handful of rice checks. Have you ever popped those like potato chips? They're pretty good. And, um, and you know, hey, I've always kind of liked the Maroon 5. That's the musical group that performed uh, during the halftime show. Uh, you know, I, so I was kind of jazzed. And, um, and then as I'm popping my rice checks, it, I realize how stunningly bad that performance was. Now, this is, this is my, my opinion. You may beg to differ, but, you know, with all that talent and all that money and all that creativity, you know, how is it possible with all that um, uh, uh, funnel into the halftime show? It, it was lame. It was just lame. I mean, Maroon 5 didn't really sound that good. And uh, Adam Levine, he looked like a, a Navy SEAL on a death mission. Uh, you know, pop music is supposed to be fun. You know, pop music is supposed to be bouncy and gleeful and spontaneous. But I think... He got a, a little over serious and 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 self important. So uh, you know he looked like he was getting ready to have dental surgery or something. As I watched that halftime show, uh, it became a morality tale for me. I began to think, now what if we start feeling? too self-important and overly serious, we can lose the spontaneity and, and bounce to life. You know, if we think that everybody is watching us and we take, you know, this poser sort of quality, listen, don't ever strip your shirt off to show your tats. <laughs> Just don't do it. Adam Levine's got all these tattoos. He was way too serious. Listen, no, li no, no, no. Listen, live with an easiness and a spontaneity. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, God, we come here with a glee and with a humility, a joyfulness at the many, many blessings of life, a joyfulness for being together, to grow in love, but so too with a humility for we have come here to bow before you to recognize something beyond self. And so with glee and with humility, we worship your Son and your Spirit today. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, it's one of the most delightful miracle stories in our Gospels. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 5. We're going to read the first 11 verses. I mean, this is an incredible story. Jesus is calling the first disciples. And Luke tells us a story that you don't find in the other Gospels. One day, as Jesus was standing at the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats 
left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered him, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so, so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats on the shore, left everything, and followed him. O oh Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts find acceptance in your sight, our rock and our redeemer, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Yes, it's one of the most delightful miracles in our gospel. Peter has been fishing hour upon hour with no luck, and he's discouraged, and he's tired, and he's given up. And so Jesus says to him, put your nets in again. Put out into the deep. Let your nets down. And then, all of a sudden, there is this overflowing abundance of fish, so many that it nearly sunk two boats. Incredible. It's a delightful miracle. Now, I want to raise the question, is this just a fish story? Or are there some spiritual insights that we can catch as well? So what I want us to do this morning is, I want us to lower our nets, our nets of interpretation, deeply into the text and see what God has to say to us. Now, Luke is doing something very special here. Uh, this is his version of the first call of Jesus to his disciples. All of the Gospels uh, have this moment, but Peter is the only one who weaves in this miracle story about the abundant catch of fish. So if you will notice, as he's weaving this story of Jesus' first call to his disciples, in a master stroke, he is teaching you and teaching me how to be disciples as well. I find in this passage two characteristics of being a disciple. It comes from two things that Jesus said. First, put out into the deep. Put out into the deep water. Now you've got a carpenter telling a fisherman how to fish. Put out into the deep. And then he says, put your nets back into the water. Now let's look at those two things. First of all, put out 
into the deep. You know, I wonder, I wonder, is there any chance that life is becoming more shallow these days? Is there any chance that life is becoming more superficial? I mean, like in my own life, or in our culture, in our politics, in our religion. Are things becoming too superficial? I mean, just a little bit by a little bit. Would we even notice? Would we even notice if ever so slowly and surely things are, are, are being dumbed down today? Would we even notice, you know, kind of like bawling a frog? Would you even notice? You know, after a while, you would be boiling in the, in the banal or, or scalded by the shallow or incinerated by the insipid. I could keep going. Would you even know it? Would we know it if, if just step by step things are becoming more shallow, more superficial? Take, for instance, our smartphones. By the way, I think it's, um, it, it, its very name is, is ironic, smartphones. Are those things shortening our attention spans? I mean, is it, are our phones taking away from a more immersive form of reading? I mean, you know, just this last week, I picked up a big, I don't know, 400-page book and I'm sitting down with a book, and, and I don't know, every page or two, I felt like I needed to scroll something with my thumbs, or I needed to, you know, click on a link to look for something else. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I think my brain is being changed. I'm, I'm really serious about this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it taking away from a more immersive form of reading? Is it shortening our attention spans? Are things becoming more superficial? Or you take our culture. Our culture prizes on busyness. Busyness. I mean... Here's the thing about busyness. If you rush around all day long, and hey, even retired people tell me about their, the busyness that's going on with their schedules. You know, if you rush around all day and you're so busy, by the end of the day, when it comes time for leisure, man, you're just wiped out. You're a zombie, uh, you know, uh, so, so at best, what do you do? You plop down in your comfy chair or on the couch and you, you eat rice checks and watch a little Netflix. What busyness will do to rob us of quality leisure? Now, you know, the ancients knew, the, Greek, the ancient Greeks knew the importance of leisure. It's leisure that allows us for deeper contemplation. It's leisure that allows us uh, the exploration of the arts and the sciences and the development of our more nobler side. Leisure is where you, you seize and develop your depth. 
If we're always so busy that all we can do at the end of the day is just crash. I mean, it, it, will, it, will, it will innervate our lives. It will, our lives will become, become more shallow, uh, more dilute. And what about our politics? Let me just comment on this briefly. Have our politics not become more superficial? Hey, I don't care who you are or which side you're on, if you're a conservative or if you're a liberal. Listen, if all you do these days is play to your base, then politics have become base, more base, more superficial, not, not nuanced, no subtleness, just base. And our religion, listen, Jesus said, put out into the deep. Don't stay in the shallow waters. Are we just waiting around these days in, in the shallowness of religion, just kind of skimming the surface? Or are we exploring the depth of our faith? You know, there, there are two things about, two qualities of depth. Depth has, has at least two qualities. One... <clears throat> There's ever more to discover with depth. Ever more. And listen, our Christian tradition is so rich and so deep. There's ever more to discover. And then another thing about depth is it can be very challenging. It can be very taxing even. Uh, you, you have to work at it. Are we working at it? Are we putting forth an effort? Or are we just kind of uh, going around with a, a bumper sticker theology? You know, little, little slogans. Are we becoming superficial? Have you noticed how that so many people will treat the Holy Scriptures? Uh, we, we, we use the Bible with such superficiality. When Jesus says, put out into the deep, what we do is we will yank out a verse that will support our opinion. That is the wrong approach to Holy Scripture. It's, uh, scripture is not a resource of verses that you can deploy and exert your opinion. No, we are to immerse ourselves deeply in Scripture and allow it, allow ourselves to be molded and changed by them. It's not there just to pull out verses. You know, you can bolster just any old opinion by taking that approach. It can be very dangerous. Like one of my professors used to say, we could be reading here, uh, uh, Judas went out and hanged himself. And then it says over here, go and do thou likewise. Oh, that can be dangerous. That can be dangerous. Oh, the superficial ways that we deal with Holy Scripture. Are we expecting too little out of ourselves? I don't know if you read today's Pastor's Corner, but, but in there I talked about um, the, 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 the uh, capacitating power of the Holy Spirit to help us to, to grasp 
and to understand. Uh, Gordon Cosby started the Church of Our Savior in Washington, D.C., and, 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 and that church had some very tough requirements. If you were going to become a member of that church, hey, it wasn't easy. There was a considerable amount of semi-technical literature that, that was required reading. And somebody asked Cosby one day, said, how can you expect the uh, common people uh, to read the likes of James Pike or Emil Bruner? And he said, I believe, I believe in, the, in the enlarging, capacitating power of the Holy Spirit. If believers are sincere enough and seek enough, the Holy Spirit can help them to understand. He believed it. Also, to be a member of that church, there had to be a commitment to community service. You had to work in a homeless shelter or one of the the, 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 the church, uh, church's uh, hospice or medical programs. Uh, are we, uh, have, we be- have we become more superficial? Put out into the deep. You know, the great theologian Paul Tillich of the 20th century said that, de- that it, depth was his definition of God. And he said, depth is the defining quality of all faith. When you experience depth, when you experience the depth of anything, uh, that is something that is, that is spiritual. Uh, by the way, we have a word for depth that refers to you and to me. Do you know what it is? soul. You are a soul. That word means depth. It comes from the old English saywall. And you know what saywall means? A deep sea, a deep lake. You are an infinite depth. Psalm 42 says, My soul, my soul longs for God. Where shall I meet God? Deep calls unto deep. But are we becoming more shallow these days? I wonder. I wonder. Uh, You know, I think, uh, you you never hear anybody quote this. You hear people quote Jesus all the time, but you never hear anybody quoting him say, put out into the deep. I think it's one of the greatest lines in the Gospels. And, and, um, but you never hear, I I think we should put it on t-shirts. I think we ought to sew it on little pillows. I think we ought to uh, put it on bumper stickers and on, on kitschy stuff. Well, that's ironic. (laughs) Put out into the deep, Jesus says. The second thing that he says is get your nets back in the water. Keep fishing. Keep fishing. You know, a lot of us can become a little discouraged and disappointed with life. And we, we back up a little from engaging in life. A lot of people today talk about how pervasive depression is. Oh, it's one of the, the great human sufferings. But now, I'm not talking about clinical depression. I'm not talking about clinical I'm talking about something that's that's a little more common than clinical depression. I see people today who are simply discouraged. They are discouraged enough 
that they've backed off a little. Their nets are, are no longer in the water. They're not at all engaging in life. They're not still after it. They just, um, they just shut down a little bit. You know, when I was a youngster and I played sports, I remember that my coaches, they always, there's something they always kept saying to me and to the rest of the players, keep your head in the game. Keep your head in the game. I mean, there was a tendency to just check out a little. And so they'd have to encourage us to keep our, our head in the game. You know, whether it was basketball, which is, boy, that's an energy game. You've got to be all in. You know, even if the flow of the game has gone away from you, I mean, you, you've, got to, you've got to constantly be thinking ahead. Get your head in the game. Or in baseball, I played first, uh, third base, but I had a good friend who was right behind me playing left field. Some of those outfielders, uh, they wouldn't see the ball for an hour, hour and a half but the coaches had to keep hollering out there, keep your head in the game. Know the situation. Are you in? Are you in? Keep your nets in the water, Jesus says. No matter how discouraged you are now, there could be a surprising abundance ahead for you. Amen? There could be a surprising abundance if you keep your nets in the water. You know, people come to me with all kinds of predicaments and they, they look for advice. I end up just listening. And that seems to do the trick. You know, they feel like I've advised them when I hadn't said a word. I just listen. But and we all have a need to be heard. We, we, we need to be listened to. But uh, sometimes when I, I do throw out a little advice, and, you know, uh, advice is, is um, it's worth 10 cents and a cup of coffee anyway. It, but I, I do find that there is a common thing that I keep saying to people. It just seems like I say this over and over again. I'll say to them, you know, you're, you're doing the right things. Your heart's in the right place. Your intention is good. Just keep at it. Keep at it. Now, that's key. Oh, that's key. There, if you'll just stay with it. If you'll just hold on, if you'll just keep moving, there'll be some surprising abundance ahead for you. Stay with it. Well, there you have it. Two keys to discipleship. Put out into the deep, and keep your nets in the water and pray for a better halftime show next year. <laughs> Amen.